its outcome by just the delivery. So once the diagnosis and the prognosis has been made in utero, you want this baby to be delivered at the right place at the best time. Also, you don't want to compromise the mother's health. And sometimes dystocia is anticipating, is anticipated from the malformation. And you have also to think of the mother. Um, the gestational age at delivery will be critical. Sometimes you have to uh, have a planned elective premature delivery. But most of the time, you would aim for 39, 40 weeks. Usually not after 40 weeks, we'll see why. You have also to be attentive to the maternal health during the pregnancy. For example, this morning we spoke a lot about high drops. The mother can develop mirror eye drops. You've heard about that condition, yeah? You give the condition whereby the uh, products released by the edema of the placenta into the maternal circulation will cause something that is very similar to hyperstimulation in IVF. This hyperstimulation will hyperstimulate the ovaries of this pregnant woman, so she will develop pain, sometimes hemorrhage or torsions of her ovaries. And also, she will be at high risk for thrombosis, so you will have to put her on anticoagulants. And sometimes she will develop something very close to um, preeclampsia because of that. So be very careful when high drops is around. Usually, for the majority, a spontaneous labor and vaginal delivery will be achievable. But uh, sometimes, if only for organization, you may have to uh, behave differently. So even when, before the time of delivery, one of these women you know as a prenatal diagnosis of malformation comes to labor wound with contractions and therefore preterm labor, then the one thing to do is to transport fetal medicine to the labor wound because it is often not just by chance that preterm labor occurs, and preterm labor is there, does not always just respond or doesn't respond to tocolytics. You have to question polyhydramnios. You have to question if you have done an invasive procedure of chorionionitis or abruption, if you've done an drainage the days before. Uh, again, high drops. Sometimes they go into labor because of fetal pain. And that's particularly true for gastroscisis, for example, where when there is necrosis of the bowel, that causes fetal pain and that triggers preterm labor. And of course, near hydro. So be aware that it is a priori not a simple threatened preterm delivery, but it might be directly <coughs> related to the fetal pathology. And then the question to ask is, what is the plan for this baby? If you had a prenatal diagnosis, you had roughly three main pathways. An active management, and if this preterm labor occurs somewhere else where this baby should be delivered, you should get this woman transferred so that the baby is born at the right place. If it was compassionate or palliative care, then there is no way to be iatrogenic here just ensure a comfortable delivery and a compassionate care of this baby that is avoid pain and, and invasive, uh, uh, invasive management. And if it was termination, then it's kind of an emergency, obviously, if she's in preterm labor. So you may have to speed up the process to the fetus site, whatever. And that can occur in the middle of the night. And also, what is the prognosis in, in relation with the uh, plan, if it's active management, what is the, the prognosis? Because if it is a malformation, you have to operate, uh, then the weight of the baby is, is incredibly uh, critical. If it's a complex cardiac malformation, they might not be willing to operate below 1,500 grams. So you have also to re-envisage other 
it is important these questions now because don't worry about that I'll, you, ha you will have the reference and this is a PDF but if you look through about 50 different malformations and you look at survival between one week and 20 years it is striking now that in recent years on average, 75% of babies with a severe malformation, at least in Europe or in the States, will survive in the very long term. And if you take now the cardiac malformation, there are more people, adults in France, with a cardiac malformation that was operated <coughs> than there are babies every year delivered with a cardiac malformation. So, this is a very particular trend that these babies are surviving more and more and therefore you should optimize their survival and quality of survival by, by delivering them the right way. Prenatal diagnosis increases the survival and the quality of care and the, 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 the growth here in, in Paris, the growth, the, the, the increase in number of malformations diagnosed prenatally largely over, overrule the number of terminations of pregnancy. So there is a huge bunch of malformations that were diagnosed prenatally, not for termination, but for optimal pre perinatal management. And we know already that if the delivery is planned, it's only because the diagnosis has been made before birth, right? And this is true for anemia, this is true for ductus-dependent cardiac malformation, for esophageal atresia, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, <coughs> severe growth restriction, and the severe preterm baby. So these will necessitate immediate care in an appropriate place. And we also know that fetal intervention can precede the delivery and optimize the fetal condition the antenatal steroids is the archetype, the treatment of monocoionic twin pregnancies when complicated. We've seen this morning through effusion. Mielomeningocele, for that not to be ruptured during the process and may be operated before birth in some cases. Hydrophic fetal arrhythmia, fetal infections. For all this critical aortic stenosis, you have a discussion of prenatal treatment. Now, this particular prenatal management aside, if you look at respiratory <coughs> distress syndrome close to term, this is for vaginal delivery. For vaginal delivery at 49, 39, 40 weeks, there is a remaining three, two to three percent, two percent of transient respiratory distress. With a cesarean section, for that to nearly become identical to vaginal delivery, you have between 39 and, four, and, 40, and 40 weeks to act on. This is sort of acceptable. It will always remain slightly higher, but it's acceptable. Obviously, the prenatal administration of steroids doesn't work on this at least not if you give them at this stage, late stage. Those probably are a bit less if you had given steroids before 34 weeks. So for those conditions, you anticipate an elective delivery, especially if you anticipate that you may not have a vaginal delivery. A single course of steroids at 32, 33 weeks might, might benefit an elective design section. And then the key word in my formation for the delivery is organization. It is key for the most severe. The timing is really critical for severe AV block. We'll look at that tomorrow. It is also uh, very uh, important when the, the cardiac surgeon should be absolutely ready if it's a complete blocked abnormal pulmonary venous return because this baby will be hypoxemic <coughs> immediately for gastroschisis and well of course when an exit procedure is planned. 
Then a second degree of emergency is those babies that are better born during daytime, because that's where the whole team is around. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia, you need two senior neonatologists on the labor ward to uh, get the best care of these babies. The Pierre Robin syndrome, because the intubation can be very difficult, and if it's left during the night to the attending physician, that might be a problem. The face and neck tumors for the same, for the same reason. Transposition of the great vessel, because the rash kind procedure, the septostomy, might be needed even on the spot in the Davery room. And the critical aortic stenosis, uh, you need an invasive cardiologist ready to dilate uh, this valve uh, stenosis. So for those, even at the expense of the risk of respiratory distress, you may want to plan that so that the, 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 this lady is not getting into labor at home and end up in the wrong place at the right time. The exit we discussed this morning, if there is a dystocia that is anticipated, then for sure you need to do cesarean section. If you, don't, if you don't anticipate a dystocia, you may allow vaginal debris. There are tables now uh, that are well adapted to an exit procedure through vaginal debris. It's just an intubation that you need to do, uh, and, and it's not going to be a tracheostomy. You can do that through vaginal debris. So when it goes uh, for, this, for those with dystocia, it goes with maternal anesthesia and fetal anesthesia and fetal migraine. So we've seen this morning the face and neck tumors. The trachea balloon ablation, obviously, uh, I'll show you one. And the debunking surgery, and we, I'll show you also one case of a pacemaker placement through an exit uh, for a very severe AV block that was not going to make it to the operating theater. <coughs> Then the third criteria is location. Timing is critical, location is everything, and uh, therefore you will have induction of labor in the vast majority of the cases to get the right time and the right place. And that, that goes for those, esophageal atresia, uh, gastrointestinal ileal, ileal stenosis, uh, omphalocils, low urinary tract obstruction, the ductal dependent uh, cardiac defects that uh, are at risk of uh, closing the uh, atrial septum, their atrial uh, communication. Pulmonary malformations with a mass effect from this morning <coughs> with goes with proal infusion and the tumors. Is the neonatal intensive care unit a specialized one? or just uh, to deal with a baby with uh, difficulty to breathe. Well, uh, for most of these, it's better if the pediatric specialist is around and not only a neonatologist. For congenital heart defects, prenatal diagnosis can be precise. It can even be confirmed by a pediatric cardiologist which is always uh, uh, advisable. And they, uh, the cardiologists have designed set different degrees of instability that is predictable. So these low instability risk or not expected, they could be, they could be delivered in another unit than a cardiologist unit. PSD, AAC, ABFC, mild, mild, mild disease, or benign arrhythmia. However, after that, it becomes higher and higher in the critical scale, and they all need to be delivered uh, where there's a cardiology unit. But the thing is, you know, you, you, you think that this is our experience in, in the care. Quite a bunch of babies born involved with a cardiac defect nine years, and the thing is, there is a discordance between the prenatal and the postnatal diagnosis, even with pediatric cardiologists, up to a third. And obviously, not all these discordances would change the management, but they do in a proportion of cases. 
these are the number of discordance that had an impact. So a diagnosis partly incorrect with a major impact, both ways, reassuring or more severe than both, 8%. So it depends how prepared you are to accept this uncertainty so that you may end up delivering more babies in your unit that would need to. But then you get more prepared to an error in your prenatal diagnosis and the disaster afterbirth. So we accept to deliver a quarter of our babies with a cardiac malformation that would not, on antenatal expertise, would not need to be delivered with us. But we increase the tolerance so that we don't miss those that are going to be more severe than we thought, and it's quite significant. Coarctation, the risk of coarctation is typical. The risk of coarctation, you will think because there is an asymmetry here, and the valves are normal. No stenosis, asymmetry, and then you will try, you will try and see the shelf uh, sign in the Arctic arch, but we know that when you suspect that prenatally, there is a big difference, a significant difference into the acute collapse or death of the neonates. It's clearly different when it was anticipated. It is uh, also true for the uh, dyspnea. It is also true for uh, the uh, arterial duct uh, closure or restriction. And uh, therefore, there is a significant benefit to a prenatal suspicion more than diagnosis, because it's a postnatal diagnosis, never a prenatal diagnosis, of uh, uh, coarctation of the aorta. And it's the most frequent cause of uh, a closure, premature closure of the uh, duct. And it goes for uh, other anomalies. Transpositional great artery, tetralogy of fallow, critical pulmonary uh, stenosis. Prenatal diagnosis is a factor of a more stable baby for surgery and a better recovery and a, 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 a lesser, lesser time spent in intensive care after surgery. And the benefit of the prenatal diagnosis goes beyond that. At the age of six, they have a better neural cognitive development. <clears throat> so it's nearly a factor of two uh, 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 of preoperative death between those that were diagnosed uh, before delivery uh, for cardiac defects. Now, the other thing is, if you look at uh, cardiac malformation, and these babies go, uh, this woman go into labor. Although you recommend vaginal delivery for most of them, if that's uh, feasible, because you have less uh, uh, respiratory, conjunct respiratory distress than you did before, we are not sure yet that uh, the complex cardiac defects will uh, adapt to the conditions of labor and the potential consequences of hypoxemia during labor for those complex uh, malformations. In doubt, we, we do deliver them vaginally, but we know that those babies with cardiac malformations are more often subjected to fetal heart rate deceleration and the variable ones and the severe ones. Although in the same studies, they usually get at the, at the delivery the same acid-base status as the non-malformed babies. So there is an uncertainty here, especially because there is a link between cardiac malformation and the long-term neurological development of these babies. Now we know that those with cardiac malformations perform less in the long-term neurocognitively. The uh, best timing to deliver cardiac uh, babies uh, in terms of uh, immediate neonatal outcome is between 39 and 40 weeks.
that's where the uh, adjusted odd ratios for mortality are the uh, lowest. So that's the target to deliver them anyway, whichever mode. But we know, again, that at the age of four years, those babies perform uh, less, and we don't have yet the explanation whether this is the uh, cerebral vascularization before birth that is obviously different with the redistribution <coughs> system than without uh, critical cardiac malformation, or whether this is the conditions of birth and the adaptation to birth and the uh, degree of emergency to take them to the surgery. Now, this is the case of a flutter. This is a uh, flutter that uh, is two to one. Oops, sorry. This is a flutter with uh, two to one frequency of the auricles, severe tricuspid regurgitation, ascites, and uh, skin edema. This baby had three lines of therapy, uh, digoxin, digoxin plus flecanide, and then digoxin plus amiodarone. Once, uh, once you've given amiodarone, once you are at the stage of uh, amiodarone, there is nothing much you can do, really. And this was 27 weeks. So uh, we decided to uh, try for the first time to do a transesophageal facing, as neonatologists would do, uh, by, by keeping the baby neutral, obviously. So we use the same device as I showed you for the plug. But the thing we, go, we put through with the endoscope is the electrostimulation probe with an overriding stimulation protocol that is the same as postnatally. So this is before. You see the auricles are, are, are facing uh, uh, twice as fast as the, the ventricles here. This is the same approach. So because you're going to have to inject something into two, I mean to intubate these babies, same approach of a general anesthesia and paralysis, because if you don't give paralysis, you will not go through the vocal cords. Mm. Mm. After that, it is simpler than a plug procedure because the, the target is not the trachea, it is the esophagus. So usually, the, uh, the device goes to the esophagus in a more sort of straightforward way. So you leave, the, you, you're, not, you're not interested in the trachea, you keep to the, you keep to the back here and you go down to the esophagus. At the esophagus, you go down. On ultrasound, you look at where, at which level you are. Um, you stop your, your scope when, when you are at the level of the uh, oracle. You pass through, then you remove the scope. You pass through the uh, overriding probe. Level. Once the probe is in, you remove the uh, mechanic uh, cannula. See the, you see the probe here? You put that in at the same level as the uh, oracle, and then you uh, electrostimulate.
structure at the of the thyroid. See, the tissue are very, very narrow. You can't see very well the, uh, the pharynx. But once you've got in, you find the trachea and the carina, it's all clear. The teratoma is not invading the trachea. So again, the intubation will be uh, visible. For abdominal wound defects, well, obviously, again, timing is critical. And then there are questions on the mode of, uh, there are questions on the mode of delivery. Because there is a selection, there is a selection bias. For those malformations like esophageal atresia, there is a selection bias by which people think that the prenatal diagnosis is not related to an improvement in the management. The reason for that is that the cases you have managed to diagnose prenatally are usually the most severe, because otherwise you don't see them, the most severe polyhydramnios the cases of esophageal atresia with abnormal heart, abnormal spine, and, and abnormal uh, extremities. All these are associated with syndromic esophageal atresia, and these are most likely to be diagnosed prenatally. Whether an isolated esophageal atresia is less likely to be diagnosed and diagnosed only postnatal. So it is a false impression that prenatal diagnosis doesn't help in esophageal atresia, but it does. It does, and it does even despite the fact that it is heavily loaded with the most severe cases. But organization uh, for the uh, management of the neonates is absolutely uh, critical. And for congenital diaphragmatic hernia, more than the plug, more than the plug that is still in evaluation, what is clearly shown is that prenatal diagnosis in a, a delivery in an expert center with a defined protocol improves survival, even without the plug. So that's the consequence of prenatal diagnosis. The issue with, with, with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, if you look at gestational age and delivery, you have as many studies that show slightly better prognosis when they are delivered before 39, and those that show that when they are delivered after 39, they do better. So this, for this, the jury is still out. But uh, now for the mode of delivery, of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, it seems that those delivered by cesarean section do better than those delivered for China. And it has nothing to do with the date and the place where they were delivered. It's within expert centers. And that we discussed this morning, the, the two forms and the, the study that is uh, running in France. The removal of the plug, uh, I think I showed you this slide this morning or not? It's another exit procedure when you remove the plug, then it's an exit, but uh, only the head of the baby is out. It's usually a quick exit because uh, then the EST will just use uh, another uh, endoscope, we just aspirate the, the, the trachea, then put another endoscope and remove the balloon as I showed you this morning for uh, doing it in utero. It's actually probably easier to do it in utero than with all this uh, mess around, but uh, when they drop your membrane and bridge up the table, it's not. And you kind of see that you can see what you want to avoid. You don't want to rupture. You don't want to rupture the sac because then it's a source of infection, and that is why it is usually advisable to deliver them with a sign section. repairing the endocopically that they can go into labor 
we will repair skin and disc anytime, anywhere. Uh, gastroparitis, gastroparitis, there is a good deal, there is a good deal of evidence to show that for gastroparitis, it is a slightly earlier delivery. Um, that is obviously without the complication. The complication being that uh, there could be a volvulus of uh, the gastrostitis, that this could cause necrosis, necrosis uh, cause pain, and it causes tachycardia and a very, uh, very little fluctuation on the fetal heart rate. So this you should take into account into the monitoring, knowing also that these babies are smaller than the other babies. There is a malnutrition here. Uh, and therefore, the third trimester is very touchy. The risk of entire trying fetal death, of bowel, of bowel injury, and uh, growth restriction. And then, it is uh, possible to have a vaginal delivery with gastroscitis. But there is also a, a strong argument that uh, elective return delivery from 35, 36 weeks onwards is better because you're exposed to not exposed to the late complications of IUDs and of uh, bowel uh, of bowel complication. If you do that, so then the mode of delivery will depend obviously on obstetrical condition. If it's a multivirus, that's fine. If it's a private, it might be a bit more. Uh, difficult to obtain that. For omphalocele, vaginal delivery would be only for very, very small ones, because otherwise the risk is to rupture the sac and to cause injury to, uh, for example, the liver, and that would not be a good idea, but for the small one, uh, you could aim for vaginal delivery. For the tumors, for the fetal tumors, sacrococcygeal gyatomas and uh, uh, thoracic Vascular tumors, it's better to do a design section because the normal, the vaginal delivery, there is a risk of uh, rupture and hemorrhage of those uh, completely abnormal vessels in the tumor. Right, okay. Yeah, questions?